Well, hello and good evening. Welcome to this live stream event on the 26th of April 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance and the Lives here. Great to have you on tonight. And a uh, very important conversation. Uh, Damien Claston is going to join me in a moment or two. Just before I bring him in, let me, as I always do, just remind you that uh, we don't provide legal or financial advice on the channel. We do moderate the chat. This is as at the 26th of April if you're watching in replay. And if you want to get my attention or ask a question, use at Walk the World. I'll make sure that I see it in my queue. And we also have enabled Super Chat, which enables you to get your question to the top of the list if you'd like, or indeed if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do here. Greatly appreciated. We don't do this for profit. We do this because we think this is a really important conversation to have. So contributions are greatly received to help cover some of the costs of what we do. Enough said on that, I think. And uh, without further ado, let me bring Damien in. Damien, hello. Um, nice to see you again. How are you doing? Can you believe another month has gone by and the markets are still wobbly? Uh, yeah, volatile, isn't it? It's um, yeah, it's exciting. It's been exciting times all all month. So, um, but yeah, I do feel as if we're we're sort of coming to a head for a few issues. Um, so yeah, let, but let's yeah, let's jump in and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more as we go through. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, it is worth um, uh, underscoring, I think, Damien, that, um, you know, that there are a, there's a level of uncertainty at the moment that I'm seeing uh, as I look out globally. We've got obviously Ukraine, we've got the bond rate issue, we've got the tech issue, um, and we've got the oh, election no. locally, all those things. So, that, you know, there are lots of balls in the air at the moment. And, and I guess sometimes the question is, is it sensible to try and actually map out what's going on and try, or is it sometimes better to say, well, maybe it's a good time to sit on the sidelines and wait for the things to sort of go flop? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah, look, it's certainly tempting to do that. Um, uh, you know, obviously, obviously I get paid to, uh, to, to, to take a view on, on, on things. So, so it's obviously it's a bit harder for me. Um, I think there is a part where uh, your know, markets have been moving so fast in recent times that, if you have a sort of strong view in either way, um, you want to be ready to go. Like it's not something. So you know, we we often talk to investors who are who are you know comfortable sitting on the sidelines for a little while and 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 waiting for a, for a catalyst. And, and really, it's about saying, well, that's fine, but make sure you you know you know where you know where you're going to put your money and what you're going to do when you when you do it. So it's not a matter of of of, of you know you do get a pullback in markets where you get events certain, certain events happen. Is you sort of scratching around, going, "Oh, I better set up some accounts now and work out how I'm going to transfer the money and go through, you know, and sell, you know, sell down this and and, and switch to something else." Is actually have your game plan sort of preset, um, and and that's I think not just yeah, that's not just for people putting new money in, but for people with um, existing money in the market is actually saying, "Okay, well, if we do get a tumble in markets, what is my game plan? Is it to panic that time and sell everything, or have I actually got a game plan in front where I'm saying, okay, if markets took a tumble of ten? 20%, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to be selling some of my bonds. I'm going to be moving into more equities. And, and of the equities, I want these types of equities or those types of equities. And that's, you know, that's really what you want to be um, setting yourself up before it happens because um, it's, you know, in, in the heat of battle, it's, 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 a, it's a lot harder to, to keep a clear head. But if you've, you've got your plan set out and this is what I'm going to do, you can always change that plan. Um, but it's much easier to, to stick to something that's sensible if you've, you've made your mind up before you know, the, the event happens. Mm, yeah, and just give you one example. Um, moving money from a bank account into a trading account, for example, ready to trade, doesn't mm. necessarily happen like that, does it? No, that's right. You know, there's different accounts will have, um, you know, you might need to be pay. You know, it often takes a couple of days. Um, you've got um, things like your, uh, you might have limits. So you might have, you know, $50,000 limits or, or something like that. You, so you just need to make sure what are your limits to transfer and you know all that type of stuff is actually yeah just knowing that you've got the the things in place and and you know if, if there's a lot of people have family trusts or uh super funds and things like that you might need multiple people to sign on to places it's just yeah i guess yeah the net effect for for me is always saying look get get everything set up get a plan written out and then you can always change it but but have that plan yep. is, yeah that plan and, and have everything set have up a plan. Ready to go. so have a plan a plan <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. And, and hope is not a not a strategy, as I said. Right? No, that, <laughs> no, that's right. And look, you know, we we I, I run financial models on on you know hundreds of different things. Uh, look, I think having a financial model is 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 a great discipline to have. But do I trust financial models? Absolutely not. You know, they're, they're only as good as the assumptions to go in there. 
But having said that, you know, having a place to start, which is I have a financial model that tells me what I think this stock is worth. Now, something's just happened. You know, they've had a huge earnings downgrade. Elon's just made a bid for it. Something's, you know, whatever is going on. Okay, now I can, around that model, now I can make the adjustments. But as opposed to sort of just finger in the air and saying, well, it's better than what it was yesterday. And so therefore I should be buying it. It's actually saying, well, yesterday it was still expensive and now it's more expensive or, or whatever it is. So, yeah. Absolutely. Now, um, Cookie asked a question, which is probably worth exploring. Um, inflation figures come out tomorrow, um, probably going to be strong. Um, the US is very strong. The UK is strong. You know, New Zealand was not quite as strong as people expected, but pretty strong. Um, mm. I guess the expectation here is that inflation will be quite strong here too. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to put a guess on the number. Uh, that's sort of, uh, but yeah, absolutely uh, expecting it to be strong. Um, it's, it's interesting as well. You know, we've obviously got central banks around the world have sort of taken that view that uh, now's the time they're going to they're going to start raising rates and um, you know and and, and normalising policy and, and then inflation they need to jump on inflation. Now the Australian central bank has sort of been um, certainly behind the rest of them. They are they have been making noises. Um, it's an interesting question now that saying will. Um, you know, will we get a rate rise next week if uh, if inflation comes in strong and, and the central bank keeps keeps talking the way they've been talking is saying, well, it's that they say they want to be apolitical, so they don't want to raise rates during an election campaign, but that's effectively being political, I guess, in terms of saying. And, you know. and they did do it once, didn't they? Was it the Howard election that he lost? I think, yeah, I, I think th so. Th yeah, I think they might I have. I think that was the one. Yeah, a couple, yeah. Of, a couple of weeks before the election, they put the rates up. Yeah, that's right. And so that's they, they obviously yeah, to, yeah, that's right. And if they do, you know, you can imagine there'll be you know the howls of outrage from from various quarters of the, the press, you know, saying that the, the RBA's got it in for the, the Liberals. Look, they've done it again. And so, uh, but you know, it's a look. <laughs> and uh, it's, I, mean, I, I do think it's policy error to do it, but um, but based on what everyone else is doing and what they've said they're going to do, hmm. yeah. Well, um, of course, they'd argue we're being data driven, data dependent, right? Which is why they've been able to change from 2024. <laughs> and it's interesting yeah. how if, if you chart over the last six months, how every time they brought the, you know, the period in closer and closer and closer and the, the quantum bigger and bigger. And it's interesting just um, reflecting on this. This is the current uh, ASX 30 day, right? 3.4% is their terminal rate over there in 18 months time, right? And the, yeah. uh, you know, they're looking at very significant increases. Now, I know these are only market indicators, but if you, mm. if you trend this chart over the last um, six months, it's been going up and up and up and up and up, right? And, yeah, and, four and months. Yeah, well, <laughs> Basically since the start of the year. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, and I guess the question is, you know, are the markets just too narrowly focused um, mm. or are they actually effectively ahead of the curve? And it's interesting, of course, we've got the same trend in the US, very similar charts, very significant rises. In fact, in the US, they're now saying we might even get a 1% rise. Um, next mm. time the Fed moves, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, the markets have priced that in, and sort of. And, and I was listening to someone the other day saying, "Well, you know, every time the Fed says this amount, the markets assume it's going to be this plus this, right?" So it's almost like the markets are trying to outguess each other. But one of the things to understand is there's a massive now tension between what the U.S. and the U.K. and New Zealand are all doing compared with China, because in China, yes. They're actually going the other way. Yeah, and actually, can we talk Japan just quickly because yeah. it's I think it's related to the China. Mm. Is that so? Japan and, and, and actually, I'll, I'll go one step further back. Let's talk Australia first. So Australia came out and said, "Hey, we've got this three-year bond target. We're going to defend it." And the market basically pushed and went, "Well, we don't think you are going to defend it." They pushed and, and the RBA basically let it go, and then came back later and said, oh, "Okay, you, yeah, we decided not to." And so, whereas uh, Japan's come out and said, "We've got a we've got a target, and it's for the ten-year bond, and we're going to defend it." And they have been. And what that meant is the currency's been been smashed in, in Japan. And so that's then sort of got a bit of a flow-on effect because they're a major competitor for, for China for a lot of these uh, goods and services. And so um, it's interesting to see, well, the market is certainly testing the, the Bank of Japan at the moment. Yeah. So they tested this, the Bank of Australia and we surrendered and ran up the red flag, you know, within a, within a week. And, and then, which I think... Has, does make a, an issue for credibility because it's one thing just turn around and say we're going to keep rates low for at least three years, and then 
well, maybe a year later, sort of go, okay, well, we didn't mean three years. We just sort of meant we'd keep it wet life for a while and markets pushed us and so we gave up. Whereas Japan's basically taking the other view of saying, no, no, we're going to keep rates low. We'll keep printing. If you want to push the Japanese yen down, then great. You know, that'll that'll help, um, you yeah, know, bring more demand, bring more um, sort of, uh, we call it, uh, more exports in Japan will be able to produce more exports at a cheaper rate. And so then that's a, that's affecting China as well. And China's got this, this problem that, um, yeah, so everyone's got, well, all countries have this, this issue about the, um, uh, the impossible trinity, they call it. So you, you can't control your, um, your interest rates uh, and your capital flows and your exchange rate. You've got to pick, to pick two of them. You can, you can control two of them, um, but then the other one sort of, you've got, to, you've got to let that one go up and down with the market. And so um, and China's uh, sort of tries to control interest. They sort of try to switch between all three. And try and control a bit of each, and um, and one of the and so they have tried to control the currency. But one of the things they do let go every now and again, they let the currency sort of um, uh, fall when when the pressures on the other two um, uh, become more extreme. And so uh, and that's how we've sort of been seeing uh, China play this at the moment is is currencies where it's been um, yeah where it's been starting to hit. Uh, they they've got that that issue about they're going through the whole COVID, um, their vaccines uh, aren't particularly effective against it. So they've, and, and they've got this zero um, COVID policy that I think uh, President Xi really has um, sort of nailed his flags to that mask. Uh, and, and, you know, I think a lot of talk within, within China, um, you know, there, there's been a real narrative there that, look, China's done a great job. You know, all those Western countries haven't done a good job. We've done this great job. You've know, got a superior model. You know, we've been protecting you. Um, and so it's, it's going to be very hard to reverse that. And so on one side, you can sort of go, yeah, they're sort of being successful um, managing to keep the virus down. But the flip side is it's at the cost of all these shutdowns and economic pain. And so then, then they've obviously got interest rate issues, currency issues, and so that's sort of um, affecting the rest, of the, the rest of the world as well, mm. and, and in particular Australia. Yeah, absolutely. I was reading something today that's suggesting that somewhere between 12 and 15% of China's GDP output is now frozen because of the lockdowns. Yeah. Right. And so, and what does this mean for supply chains? Does this yep. mean that, you know, all these banked up supply chains in, in the US, is this going to give them a chance to flush themselves and to, to catch up? Well, um, they're all queued outside Shanghai at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You see, I mean, there'll still be shortages, but I guess what I'm saying is all your, your ships, you won't have the ships off sitting off LA anymore mm. and all the, all the, um, uh, tra- all these uh, containers in transit across America. Because mm. so, yeah, that, that might solve that problem. But does it, it might only be a short-term solve because then all of a sudden there's a flood coming across from, from China when China reopens and, and all those goods and the orders that have been put through actually do finally make it. So, well, yeah. I, was, I was reading something else from um, one of the government sources and they were suggesting that up to 90% of our um, imports, you know, consumable imports are coming from China. Mm. <laughs> Which is, if you think about right. it, it doesn't make, you know, that's probably quite close because... That's been the major source. So suddenly that's all turned off, right? Suddenly we can't get the stuff that we want to get. So that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And the other interesting point, just wanted to go back to the, um, uh, this is the Shanghai Composite, right, which took another bath today. So it's way, 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 way down. It's at 2887. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. hugely down. Um, yes. And, and that's really a reflection uh, that, uh, you know, the markets are, are beginning to say, well, hang on a moment, maybe this isn't quite um, what we expected to see. Uh, they did actually cut some of their um, rates and they've reset the um, the target range for the, um, uh, the, the exchange rate between the US dollar and uh, the, the yuan, but it's gone by that again. So uh, it's not, not good. No, no, that's right. <laughs> and, so, and, and they've also got that. And so the other third part of that was in the capital controls and, mm. and how much money is coming in and out. They, they do have a lot of... Um, they do want to sort of make sure that they're, they're trying to keep on top of that. And so that's, um, you know, that's that part of saying that, uh, you know, the markets will push and that, and, and there's actually a, one of the uh, investment banks came out, I can't remember which one it was, but their theory was that, um, uh, that what the Chinese government was going to do sort of over the next little while was actually, yes, the currency would probably fall, but they were going to make it volatile. Mm-hmm. They're actually going to support it rapidly for, for, you know, a week or two here and there and really push it up and then it might fall again and then they'll, they'll jump in and, and, and do things as well. Basically to to take away the idea that there's what this is a one-way bet about, you know, they, they, you, sometimes you get this extra pressure um, where markets are expecting something, they just keep 
pushing and pushing and pushing until eventually something cracks. And, and I guess the idea is that um, yeah, the Chinese government would be um, manipulating the currency to to try and yeah push it around the edges of those to to, to at least try and flush traders out and, and and get them out of you know out of doing stuff in, within the, the the Chinese currency. So well, yes. be interesting. I, I don't know whether this has flushed them out, but it certainly gives them a bit of a scare. This is the uh, dollar yuan, right, which is now sitting at six point five four. And look at this, look at this run up over the over the recent times, right? And so and we're talking six point three to six point five, right? I mean, this is a big move. Uh, and this mm. is probably the most it's been for um, for quite some time. In fact, if you if you if you let's change the scale and go back a bit longer, I mm. mean, th okay, that there were times previously when it was up up at seven, that was in mm. 2020. But you know, more that's a big move, and uh, a very significant move in the short term. So, yeah, very interesting question as to <laughs> what does this all mean for China, and therefore what does it mean also for the. Um, trade structure uh, and two other points um if you look at what's happening with where the um, yuan is some of the investment that was going into china is now flowing back out of china because the uh, relative yields have actually moved around quite dramatically and we also know that the uh, fed in the u.s is supporting japan directly to help them with their um uh keeping their um currency in 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 place Right. So there's already international flows going all over the place under the waterline, which uh, mm. isn't obviously transparent, but is actually part of this, um, you know, piping and infrastructure that we've got relating to the way that the finance market works. Yeah. And plus, um, yeah, obviously the sanctions on Russia and, and China helping to, to buy uh, Russian, um, uh, Russian oil and, and other various products sort of around the edges as well. That's sort of all. All sort of one more factor that's that's sort of bouncing around in there, mm. and um, and and what flows, I guess, from China are sort of effectively sort of proxy Russian flows. Is, if, I know if, if you know what I mean in terms of yes, Russia's bought rubles, but you know, they've converted into whatever. Well, just quickly on Russia, of course, Russia has um, linked the uh, uh, the ruble to gold, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. an interesting That's... little move because that then that makes it sort of more like a petro currency uh, than it was before because of course it's now connected to the dollar. So <laughs> that in itself, I think, is quite interesting. And the reason they can do it because they've got a lot of gold sitting in Russia. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and the other thing is, um, I think we spoke last time on here about saying, um, you know, my my sort of take on especially the oil side of it. I thought the gas side's a bit harder, but the oil side of it was that look, Russia has got. Um, Russia is producing a certain amount of oil. Uh, India and uh, China are consuming a certain amount of oil every year. And that, um, yes, it was hard to get the oil from, from Russia down to, to India and China. But, um, you know, there, there's clearly a scenario where basically rather than Russia sending its oil to, to Europe, it now sends it to, to China and, and, and India. And uh, the Middle East, rather than sending it to China and India, now starts sending it to Europe. And so basically all the oil has to sit, you know, on, on a ship for two weeks longer or three weeks longer. Um, but it's, it's effectively a similar type of similar amount of production um, ending up in a similar bit. And we are starting to see the oil, um, uh, the, you know, the first cargo load sort of started to hit, I think probably two weeks ago in in, in China. So that that sort of started to flow. Um, there are some issues around are there enough ships, and you know, there's all the a few sort of sort of shorter term issues, but um, it does seem to be going in that direction very much. Um, so I guess that's sort of a that's an argument for for oil price. You know, ending up lower, but there's a, you know, a short-term push while, um, while while more oil has to sort of be sitting on ships for a longer period of time. But um, that you know the production will will just shift around the world, and and as as with most commodities, I mean we saw that uh, with Australian when when China came out and said they're going to target Australian commodities, and they you know they weren't going to let them come through. Is that most of them just ended up somewhere else? So you know there's a certain there's only a certain amount of barley in in the world. The fact that China wasn't Buying our barley meant that China was buying Canada's barley and Brazil's barley and 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 wherever they, you know, wherever they took that from, whether it was Europe or the Middle East, is that our, that's where our barley ended up. And so, um, yep. you know, it's a similar type of argument with um, with oil. Well, I did a post the other day, most making that exactly that point that you know the the impact of the Chinese um, you know restrictions on exports from Australia hardly had any effect because mm. we were actually able to sort of shift those elsewhere and it just moved the moved the, the, the pudding around, but it didn't actually change the pudding, it just moved it around, right? 
Be, be, because they're commodities. Yes, yeah. Exactly. So some things don't work. So, so obviously no. education, which mm. I'm hoping education is not a commodity, but, you know, <laughs> that's, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of argue. I think some people would argue against me on that one. But, um, you know, the, there's not an easy source to replace all, all the Indians, sorry, the, the Chinese students mm. um, yeah. that, that, are come, that, that sort of came to Australia. But um, most of the other ones, uh, yeah, commodities are very easy to switch around. Nobody really cares about it. And that's exactly what the position Russia is finding itself in is that, okay, yeah, it's hard for them to, to import certain things, um, you know, uh, IT sort of uh, and some of the knowledge-based economy, the, yeah, that's that's sort of gone and, and not coming back. But the commodity side of it, yeah, that's the, the oil um, and, and the gas to a certain extent is quite easy to shift around. Um, yeah, the problem with the gas is... Uh, is is if you don't have pipelines to where your customers are, that's that's obviously an issue. Um, but yeah, the, the exit, com, you know, commodities are are, are ultimately you know, that's all. It's in, it's in the name. They they they're interchangeable for. And Macron coming back, of course, um, uh, in France, and uh, uh, wanting to essentially put pressure now on Germany to turn off Russian oil. Uh, and quite yes. quickly, that can have another interesting um, you know, knock-on effect. But it's interesting, the WTI at the moment is actually at 98, right? So it's below the 100. So it has come off its highs of 128. Uh, and mm. uh, that's partly perhaps something to do with the um, demand uh, downturn from China because of the, um, the lockdowns. And partly because, as you say, some of these supply chains are now sort of readjusting and therefore the, uh, the peaks may, may be off. But people in Germany are still very concerned about the impact because they're saying that will cause a recession. Yeah, I know. And, and I've read a number of articles from, you know, from others in people in different parts of, um, you know, Europe talking about how well, you know, uh, you know, a dozen years ago Germany was explaining quite carefully to Spain and Italy and, and Greece about how, um, you know, you just have to go through some austerity and take some take some pain for the good of the European Union. And to, um, you know, yes, you might have higher unemployment and it might be tough for you as an economy, but, you know, for the good of the European Union, you really should do this. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a quite a reasonable argument in the other direction now, saying, well, for the good of the European Union, maybe Germany should take time for Germany to take some pain. So, um, yeah, but, you know, it we'll see. boot on the other foot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and there are a number of German politicians, though, and, and particularly the, the the party that's in power at the moment, who have some quite close uh, linkages with Russia. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the ex-Chancellor from um, Schroeder was sort of still on the board of, of a number of these big Russian companies and makes, you know, a million dollars a year or more from, from Russian ones. So um, there's a um, – it's not, it's not a simple uh, – it's not as simple as Russia as Germany just deciding yes we'll do it because there are some there's a number of people who have to sort of basically do a 180 degree turn and and they've admitted they were wrong in some ways but but you know nobody wants to admit their entire um, you know, entire philosophy was wrong. Absolutely. Well, it is it is a philosophical positioning, of course. Now um, mm. there's a whole bunch of questions in the chat. I might just um, pick up a couple of them because there's quite some interesting stuff, and uh, mm. it may lead us into um, some of your charts. There's this um, one here about how does Australia's credit boom not lead to a housing bust like what followed Greenspan's final years, uh, which is you know a, a way into it. If rates go up, what happens? Uh, mm. And I know you've got some slides on that. And um, there's also a, a bit of a question of, um, well, will, will the RBA move or, or, or won't? A smooth operator says, um, nice graph, but it'll note this talking about the, the rate. RBA will, is scared to raise rates. So will, are they, how independent are they? Will they raise rates? Do they know that if they do raise rates, it could actually create mayhem in the property market? And are they going to actually be um, you know, sanguine about it because of that concern about the property market, bearing in mind how much of the debt is linked to property. And um, um, this one from uh, Fraser basically said rates need to increase by 3% to cause significant chaos in Australia. The average mortgage seven is a zero, I think. Yeah, I think I that's think right. Zero, I, I so. wish it was. <laughs> that could be after the crash. <laughs> yeah. But no, the, the point is, though, people are highly leveraged. So, um, I know you've got some slides on that. Do you want to sort of explore that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, so run a, a property model for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, we've got a property calculator, so that basically goes through and and runs uh, looks at property valuations. And the idea behind it is saying, um, you know, how how do you actually value a property? So, if you look at it, if you one way is to look at yield, and that's from an investment perspective. 
Um, but that's obviously problematic is to that yield, uh, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, the yield has just gone down and down and down and down. And so, you know, is is two percent the right yield? Is one percent the right yield? Is three percent the right yield? You know, there's not a really, uh, you know, there's not a lot you can do. Um, you sort of put your finger on in terms of that. Uh, and the other issue, probably the bigger issue, is that um, houses are there to live in. So people like to live in houses, and 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 um, you know, if you're moving into it, you don't really think about it as yield. And so the two key ones I tried to look at is is um, what I call the affordability measures. And so, in terms of those, uh, there are these ones on, on the left hand side. And so, what I look at is the mortgage payment relative to rent. So, um, if you took out an eighty percent, yeah, took out eighty percent and put down a down payment of twenty percent um, over the, at the prevailing interest rates, um, how much is your how much is your mortgage? And what you tend to find is that, say, in a market like Sydney houses, it goes somewhere between one hundred percent and and two hundred percent. So, so basically, when um, your rent is basically the same as your mortgage, then most people in Sydney then want to buy a house. And when it gets to basically your mortgage is double the, the, what your rent is, then people start flipping back the other way and, and house prices start to fall and, and, and um, you know, people, people prefer to rent. The other one is then looking at your mortgage payments to full-time wages. And so that's the first two columns. What I've done there is uh, this is actually looking at it over time and saying, well, if I did a percentile where 100% was as expensive as it's ever been over the last um, 50 years, and um, what and zero is as cheap as it's ever been, um, where do all these different um, cities cities sit? And so you can see there, say Sydney, for example, rel- on a mortgage payments to relative to full time wages. And keeping in mind we haven't even had a rate rise yet, that's as high as it's ever been on, on that perspective. You know, if you look at mortgage payments relative to rent. For both Sydney and Melbourne, you're you're almost at the 90th percentile, so so in the top 10 percent of most expensive ever. And just um, just to clarify one thing there: that is interest and principal, right? Because the RBA, when they quote their numbers, they only quote interest payments; they don't quote capital repayments. Yeah, that's right. So do it on a 30-year mortgage, which you know, to be frank, 30 years ago, a 30-year mortgage probably wasn't that common. It was probably more 20, 20, and 25-year mortgages. But um, yeah, I think it's to keep, to keep things constant over that over that time frame, yeah, it was on a on a thirty year mortgage. Um, I mean, some of the other factors I do have on there as well: property prices to full time wages, which is sort of you know, can you actually afford a deposit? Now they're all horrendously expensive, but um, you know, on the flip side, that's a sort of a that's a one off expense, uh, and you you can get you know uh, whether it's inheritances or or the bank of mum and dad or or whatever it is that that actually gets that gets you over that that. Um, first part, I guess. What I, I guess I look upon it as saying that's one measure which um, has some sort of difference. But I think the ongoing, every single month, you've got to if you're making a wage and then you've got to pay it out as a mortgage. You know, you need to that that needs to be a, a constant and ongoing. Or or if it's cheaper to rent than what it is to buy, will people flip and, and stop buying as much? And so um, and you see, there are still some markets that are cheap. So Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth are still. Um, Oh, sorry. Maybe, maybe Brisbane, had, Brisbane and Perth uh, units are still relatively cheap um, relative to where they've been. Adelaide's probably more sort of average, um, but uh, yeah. So that was that's one. Um, I'll flip these. But this is sort of just looking then at say the mortgage rates. So um, and so what I do on the mortgage rates is I look at the I use the mortgage rate as being the lowest of the three year rate and the standard the discounted standard variable rate. And so you can see that even though we haven't had a, a, an official rate rise, because the RBA put on the cheap three-year mortgages, um, that sort of brought down the average mortgage rate. And now they've um, now they've lifted that again. So now now um, yeah, your three-year mortgage rates have, have jumped quite significantly. And, and now we're looking at sort of standard variable rates as to what I'm using. And so that's as that's but having even though they jump, they're still um, in the, at the six percentile. They're still basically almost as cheap as they've ever been at any other time in, in history. So that's your mortgage rates. Um, uh, and then I do real wages. Now, we're still not seeing – we've seen some, some nominal wage growth, um, but we're still not really seeing anything significant in terms of the wage growth. Maybe that's coming. Uh, there has been a jump in rents, so that will obviously um, uh, helps to flow through to make things – make it more attractive to buy a house if your rents keep going up. Um, but it's guess the question is, is this a catch-up for the um, – for the big negatives we've had in, in terms of rent growth over the last couple of years, or is this like the start of this ongoing trend where you know rent's going to grow at five percent per annum now for 
you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm probably more into the, the catch-up stage, but, um, uh, yeah, it remains to be seen. Um, I wanted to highlight Brisbane in particular, Brisbane Houses, where they sort of suffered the, the, the largest fall, I guess the most rapid fall in affordability. So um, if you look at, say, mortgage payments to wages, uh, it was actually relatively cheap um, a couple of months ago, and that's just rocketed up now to sort of sitting at almost in the, the top 10th percentile of, 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 um, of where it's been. Uh, and then similarly for the mortgage payments to rent, um, you know, were quite cheap and now they're in the sort of the, the top 25% of, of where they've been. So I guess that's where things have sort of worsened the, the fastest, if that makes sense. Um, Sydney houses is the other interesting one. Um, so you'd see the mortgage payment to median wages is now, um, you know, higher than it's ever been. So despite the, the no official interest rate rises, uh, mortgage payment to rent is already at 173%. So basically, you, basically what you're saying is, what that's saying is it costs you 73% more to rent, to, to, to buy a place just in the mortgage payment than what it does to rent. And that's before you've had to pay all your extra rates and, and and repairs and all that other type of stuff that goes into to owning a house. So, um, you know, from that perspective, um, I guess you jump into the calculator and, and you can play around with the, these assumptions and make assumptions about where you think these ratios will go and, and what you think um, interest rates are going to do. And you can just see that that, that makes a huge difference to um, the housing prices. Um, and in particular, um, uh, the other, in particular, the, the one I wanted to highlight that it makes a difference to is if you is I've got one in there using no using no debt and one using debt, and what you'll really see is that um, if you don't use any debt at all, often the outcome over a sort of a ten year period is is, is reasonable. Um, so you get some, you get a little bit of rent growth. Um, you've got a rent coming in, and even if the house price is going nowhere or even slightly backwards, yeah, you know, the returns at least it's not negative. So you're still you're still doing all right. The problem is because people use so much debt. And um, if we're talking about interest rate rises, is that um, all of a sudden the debt can turn um, what might have been just a, a, mm -hmm. an average or, or, or a little bit bad um, in investment into a very bad investment. So, you know, if you put down 200000 on a million-dollar property, for example, um, and uh, you don't need to see, you know, straight away you've probably lost, um, I don't know, 50 to fifty to 70 grand or something like that on your, um, just on your stamp duty and all your entry costs. So so you're already out a whole bunch. Um, if you actually exit that at the end of 10 years, you, you're going to lose another bunch of that. So you're probably out, you know, over a hundred grand just in your entry and exit costs. Um, it doesn't take much of a movement and, and, you know, you can wipe out your entire $200,000 investment um, over that time frame. So, um, you know, the, uh, uh, debt can never make a good investment um, uh, sorry, it can never make a bad investment good. Um, it can make a good investment great because it sort of takes a, say, a, you know, a, a seven or an eight percent return into turns it into like a twenty percent return or a thirty percent return because you've got that extra leverage effect. But um, there's a lot of scenarios where you can see now where you might have got a zero percent return or a one percent return if you bought it outright, but then if you use debt, you end up losing, um, you know, uh, bucket loads on your um, on. on on your investment. So yeah, so that's that'd be the real thing. I'd, I'd sort of, you know, anyone who's thinking about buying, jump in, play around with some of the assumptions onto that calculator and just have a look at um, what you think is going to happen. You can change inflation rates. You can change, um, you know, what you think, where you think the mortgage payment to rent should end up. And, and um, uh, but, but the net effects you really see is that any, any time you get rising interest rates, um, it's very, very hard to see good returns for, uh, for property. Mm, absolutely. And let me just share with you, uh, this is from my model. So I'm looking here at the relative uh, influence of housing affordability or house prices mm. on various factors, right? And interest rates and credit availability are by far... Oh, it stopped. Lost, lost it there, yeah. Um, yes, try that one again. Uh, interest rates and credit availability are by far the biggest element in all of this. Mm. Um, now, uh, and and that what that means is that the biggest impact to what happens in terms of affordability or or not is what happens to credit availability and interest rates. Everything else, migration, government stimulus, just doesn't have the same impact on the overall. Mm. On the uh, so so it's the most powerful set of levers, right? 
And yet, mm. of course, the Reserve Bank says, no, house price has nothing to do with us, despite the fact they're set monetary policy. And APRA says, nothing to do with us, despite the fact they actually set the parameters with regards to lending um, you know, uh, numbers as well. So whichever way you look at it, there's something fundamentally wrong <laughs> in, our, in our government st structure when the RBA and APRA both say, nothing to do with us. And then, of course, the government says, well, you know, it's the state supply side issues. No, no, no. These are demand side issues, right? The demand side, credit, credit availability, lending standards and interest mm. rates are the most powerful precursors to housing price growth or housing price falls. Absolutely. And that's that. Um, uh, and we talked beforehand, you're saying that I hadn't realised I was high as what you said. I knew that there'd been some tightening, but I think you were saying so between 8 and 15%, was that? Yeah, so I was talking today to a couple of mortgage brokers who are finding the banks have throttled back their lending parameters, somewhere between um, 8 and 15%. Yep. Mm. So that means that people's borrowing power has already been reduced. Yes, <laughs> and, then, and, then you get your, and then you get your interest rates where, you know, uh, 18 months ago or even probably six or seven months ago, you could come in and, and borrow it sort of on a three-year fixed rate and, and get close to 2%. And now you're talking about 3.7-ish um, yep. in terms of what you're um, in terms of what you're looking at for, yeah. for a standard variable. So, so there are some very cheap standard variables for lower LVR loans. But mm -hmm. if you're not low LVR, you'll have to pay more. And if you're on a fixed rate, the two-year and the three-year and the five-year are a couple percent higher than they were just six months ago, right? So anybody yes. who's got a fixed rate and then is going to have to reset it over the next period, whatever that period is, is going to have to pay a lot more. But yet what's interesting is if you look at the results from you know, the banks most recently, they're all having margin compression. So effectively the cost of funds are continuing to rise. Um, <coughs> they're not paying much back to depositors. They're um, trying to actually keep some cheap loans to try and attract people, but the fixed rates are going through the roof. So this pincer movement, of higher rates is not only going to have an impact on individual borrowers and, and, and the households, but also going to have an impact on the banks and their profitability as well. And that's something else to bear in mind, and presumably the Reserve Bank will be thinking about this in terms of financial stability, the APRA will have to think about it too, right? So it makes you wonder. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and Australia's price, you know, you showed a few charts there of, of um, how you'd been, uh, uh, of, of all the interest rates that have sort of been been priced into the Australian market. Mm. Now, I, I'm a little bit, my chart's a little bit out of date, but I've got one here that's sort of showing that um, the expectations of other countries, and you can see Australia's actually at the top. So so we're behind <laughs> starting below everyone else, but the expectations priced in is that, that the RBA is going to go further than any other country. Yeah. So, because um, I think we're, we're almost at 3.5 now. I think on that, I think 3.4. So this, this one's only got us a 3.25 sort of by the end of it. Yep. But, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess the it's it, – I find it I find it curious that the, the country that's the, the most over-leveraged um, uh, and the most reliant on these commodity imports and exports is is the one where markets are currently expecting interest rates to, to rise the most. And, and, also, and also the country that's – the furthest, starting furthest behind all, all these other countries. Yeah, because we haven't so, moved. We haven't moved at all, right? No, that's no. right. Whereas most of these others have already, um, yeah, have already yep. started. Correct. So, you know, um, New Zealand started, they're at 1.5% already. Mm. Um, the expectation is that there'll be more as well. And it's interesting just noticing this is actually from um, ANZ, which, uh, no, this is from Westpac, I should say, which showed the... Um, move the terminal cash rate. In other words, where does the cash rate go to? If it went up to four percent, which is not a million miles from where that chart that I showed earlier on is, that would be the highest it's ever been in terms of the debt servicing ratio. Right? Even mm. three percent would be pretty extreme, and three percent is definitely baked in, um, which shows you just how far. So Westpac argues, oh, they can't do, they can't do that. They will probably go to something like two percent, maybe, but that's about it. Um, but the international situation with regard to what other banks are doing, particularly central banks around the world, it's going to impact what Australia does, right? We, we can't operate in a, in a complete vacuum, not least because the mm. exchange rate will, will, will get crunched in the process if, if we did that. So Yeah, which, which I, I, I've got no problems with the exchange rate getting crunched, but, uh, yeah, I think that's – I actually think that's our solution. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's our help to get out of this because yeah. – um, 
Uh, we'll speak a little bit, I'm sure, about the you know, the state of Australian manufacturing and other things. Mm. But, um, you know, one of those problems is that I do think uh, the RBA, the, my, my thumbnail sketch of, of, of the last sort of 20-odd years was the RBA actually was in front of the curve on the whole China's going to be bigger and this resource things, you know, this resources, there's, there's this resource boom coming. And they they were, uh, they genuinely did some good some good research in the early 2000s about it. And then I think they got too in love with their own research and and, and sort of followed it through and went, yes, this boom is going to last for, for 30 years, just as the whole thing finished and the whole thing peaked. And, um, and they basically let the currency go too high. Um, and because the currency went so high, all this manufacturing shut down, the car companies all left, um, you know, manufacturing more than halved in terms of the, uh, as a proportion of our economy. Um, and it just, that doesn't come back until, um, you know, you see exchange rates drop much, much lower. And so we've sort of rolled ourselves from a mining boom into a housing boom, um, and, and, and arguably a people boom in there as well, just keep the, that, everything that's going. my theory about quantitative easing in Australia for a long time was people based, right? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. I've called it quantitative peopling is what we did. As we sort of yeah, just fill the fill the economy with more people to make yep. make the uh, make GDP look bigger, even though GDP per capita was terrible. Mm. Um, and so yeah, so that's. Um, do, uh, do, do you want to show that? Um, I, I put that chart up. It's quite interesting. That's actually the real household disposable income per capita, right? And from yeah. two thousand and ten onwards. There's been no growth per capita, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. So, so what I've done is I've only done up to 2019 just to get rid of the the um, you know any of the things going on with uh, the boom bust around coronavirus and all that type of stuff. Mm. So I was just sort of showing you know this is what was this is what was was our, our political economy and and because I want to talk about um, you know putting this into context of what's the difference between, from an investment perspective you know what should I do if Labor gets in what should I get do if the Liberals get in. And so I just want to sort of say that, you know, yes, we had all these non-recessions, but, um, you know, we really did, um, we, we did all the, the hard lifting and, and all the, the changes sort of um, in the Hawke and Keating years um, or in the early Howard years, you know, of GST and all these, uh, you know, number of productivity gains. And then since then, we've just been cruising. It's all been about bringing more people in and that, um, you can, as you can see, that no per capita income growth for, um, you know, just an extraordinary length of time. Um, and that was why I think we had so much political instability, though, as well, um, because every every um, election would show up and you'd have politicians telling people, hey, you guys have never had it go so good. You know, look how fast GDP is growing. And everyone's sort of going, feeling, going, just a minute, I don't feel like I'm having a good time. You know, this is maybe I'm, maybe I'm voting for the wrong party. And so, because, you know, no one, no, one, no one likes to be told how great they're having it when, when they don't think they are. Um, and then you go into, well, what actually got us through? And you go, well, there's this mining capex boom. And I just want to, you know, that really saved us from recessions. And I just want to highlight that that was, um, you know, 6 7% of, um, of GDP. Uh, you know, the Gorgon project alone um, was 5% of GDP, although it was spaced over like a, a number of years. But like this one project in one location um, added 5% to Australia's GDP over a number of years. It's just like the numbers were incredible in terms of what you, you know, when you, when you, when you sort of take a step back and, and look at all that money that's coming through. Um, that population change I spoke, you know, we, we had this huge population surge around the, the financial crisis um, of, you know, uh, almost 400,000 people, or sorry, more than 400,000 people um, that sort of really helped save that, um, save your GDP in terms of, you know, didn't didn't really help you from a from a uh, per capita, but but from a total perspective, you know the bit the pie was bigger. Um, just you know, Martin, your slice was a bit smaller, and my slice was a bit smaller, but but that, because the total pie was bigger, they could they could say they're doing a great job. <laughs> and then arguably, that's what they've then said. Now it's just padding the stats, just going well. Let's just keep doing that to try and to try and pad the stats. Um, you know, we're top ten for GDP per capita, so we're we're you know we're we're a rich country. But we're, and this one, we're at number 93. I sort of used the, the one beforehand, you know, uh, for, for economic complexity. So, so basically we have a, 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 an economy that was as complex as Uganda and Senegal. Um, I think we've rocketed right up the, um, right up the ratings of like another four or five measures now. Now we're, now we're vying with Kazakhstan to, in terms of economic complexity. So, you know, we're, we just don't have the, we don't have a, a, um, a modern economy, despite um, despite our riches, um, and then we've got this gas issue, and you know this is the one that 
you know, you, I could you know, go on for a whole hour about this, but I'll just do the, the thumbnail sketches. You can see us there, you know, from 2015 to 2020, we went from, um, you know, what you know, a certain amount of exports, a relatively big exporter to basically, you know, neck and neck with Qatar for the biggest exporter of, of LNG. And I think they were getting sort of, um, I think we were basically getting 80% less or 90% less in terms of actual revenue than what um, uh, Qatar was getting. I think at one stage, companies had, um, oh, what was the percentage? I think it might have been 15% of GDP in tax losses, um, maybe even 20%. Um, so, so like all these Chevrons and Exxons have got like, you know, uh, multiples of, our, of like they've got these stored tax losses that just mean they're not going to pay tax for 20, 30 years because they spent so much on these projects. And so while it's great that we're exporting all this gas, we're just not getting the money from it. We're not, the average Australian is not benefiting from it. It's, it's these, these foreign companies or, or a couple of local companies um, that are making all the money from it. And meantime, our local gas prices have, have are up two or three times, which means all the manufacturing leaves. And um, uh, and, and as part of this, the uh, both sides of parties, both sides of policies were involved, which is why we never hear about it, was that they put in this uh, petroleum resent, rent resource tax, which meant that uh, it was this whole idea that when they get when these companies make super profits, then then the Australian government will do much better. But the net result of it really was that um, we, we hardly get any money for it and that we're now facing high, these high gas prices on the East Coast. Uh, if you look at the West Coast where they did the um, gas reservation, gas prices are still sort of about half what you see on the East Coast. But, um, you yeah, know, we've, we've basically done it to ourselves. We've decimated our own manufacturing. Um, we've done what basically no other country has done, which has said, yes, we'll open up our entire East Coast to, to global prices rather than taking advantage sort of you know, every other country that's got riches of gas basically says we'll give, we'll we'll make sure they reserve you know ten percent of it or whatever proportion for for local people first, and even Western Australia does that, and you, you see the benefit. But you know the eastern states, um, and it was a bipartisan you know bipartisan measure to um, to stuff that up. So so we never hear about it. So yes, yeah, so that's that's sort of where we where we were. Um, and the other thing we do is international students. We've brought in international students um, on a on a per 100,000 uh, population, we're three or four times in front of any other developed country in terms of the amount of students we've, we've brought through. Um, and, and you speak to people, um, I think you've had uh, Salvatore Bobonis mm. here. Yes, he yeah. yeah, yeah. so he's obviously, you know, I think this might have been one of his charts, yeah. but, you know, he just yeah. talks about it basically being, we're the cheapest. And yep. so we're basically, we're, we're fighting on price. And so um, Not if you quality. want to... Exactly. You know, the first choice for a lot of these people is, yes, I'll go to the UK or I'll go to the US or, or Canada. And then if I can't get into there, then um, I'll still be able to get into Australia and just, yeah, and, and, it, was, and it won't be that expensive compared to the other ones. Mm. So, yeah. So, yes. So that's, that's sort of where we got to where we, where we got to. And it's not, a, it's not a pretty picture and it's not sort of good for individuals. Um, it's good for a lot of companies. A lot of companies sort of, you know, very much leveraged to this whole trade. And you know, your house and holes economy, but um, and they're the companies that are the biggest donors into political parties. But it's not a sustainable model. It's not something that's going to last us, you know, for years. And so, um, yeah. So the other one I want to highlight then. So, so I'll jump into preempt sort of what's the difference between the parties. You know, from debt and government spending, I can't see any real differences. Um, uh, you know, uh, arguably. The Liberals will be will spend a bit more. Certainly, the, the certainly pork barrelling a bit more, um, but you know maybe maybe Labor would spend more. You know, in, in the longer term, I guess is the expectation. But so it's pretty hard to tell. On the RBA, there's no real difference. Foreign affairs, look, they'll they'll both sort of say what they would have or should have done. But and maybe like Labor's slightly more China friendly, but it's pretty hard to see any real difference between it. Um, health, aged care, education. Yeah, there's some difference in spending, but but overall, there's no reform. Um, Childcare, uh, Labor's targeting more lower income earners, whereas whereas uh, Liberals sort of opening it up a bit more to everyone. But again, the, in terms of quantum's, there's not not nothing, no real big difference. Um, I think the biggest one, um, the, the, the biggest one economically is the inequality side. I do think that both sides are sort of um, sort of locked into this sort of drift towards inequality. Um, on corruption side, uh, Labor 
I, I think we'd absolutely do more, but how much more? I, we just don't know. Like it's, I think their 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 position basically seems to be they'll 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 do more than what the Liberals did, but but we just don't know whether that means a meaningful change or not. Um, and then on climate change, though, uh, I didn't we didn't really we spoke last time about a lot of the price things. I think not blocking the states and and just sort of not actively trying to block some of the changes will actually make a huge difference on that because most of the economics have sort of hit the stage where um, companies are more than willing to take over. Um, and, and it's sort of, you know, if governments aren't getting in the way. So, um, uh, but on the corruption side, I just wanted to highlight that this extremely badly named CPI score, but it's the Corruption Perception Index from Transparency International, and you can just see that this is only the last 10 years, is, um, you know, we've gone from basically the top of the range to, um, to, to um, you yeah, know, bottom, bottom of developed countries or towards the bottom of developed countries in terms of corruption. Um, and, the, and the other thing over the last similar type of thing, but the trust in government. Um, so, you know, 10 years ago, or sorry, in 2010, we were, uh, so a dozen years ago, we were number four um, in terms of trust in government. And then um, now we're uh, yeah, below average and, and sort of chasing Hungary, which, you know, the Hungarian Prime Minister, I don't know how much you've seen, but he's quite, quite tightly tied to Putin and sort of, you know, they have active protests about the amount of corruption that's going on in, in Hungary and, and, and their, you know, their issues with that. So, you know, we've certainly gone from, from top of the range to, um, to, 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 to we're heading quite closely, to, uh, well, we're certainly below average now and, and heading in the wrong direction. And so do I think these things matter? Um, I think from, from year to year they don't really matter. Um, I, but I do think there's a there is a tipping point at some point where uh, Australia goes from yes it's a great place to do business and you know without the corruption you know you can win contracts on on your merits and all that type of stuff to um, you know lumped in the same sort of categories as as um, some of the more corrupt countries and 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 the expectation is you have to basically pay off the government through whatever means you know. What it means you can backdoor through the, the you know, donations through the government, and that's where companies stop putting things into Australia and they start going, well, I've got a choice. I've got an, setting up an Asia Pacific. You know, I've got a choice. I can put it in New Zealand. I can put it in Japan. I can put it in Singapore. I can put it in Australia. Uh, I'll pick Singapore because at least I know they're you know on the corruption side they're they're, they're, they're better off, or or they'll pick a country that's um, you know New Zealand or something like that where they they feel as if they'll they'll get a um, a better a, a better um, a better outcome. Now, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're certainly those. None of those trends, you know, uh, are headed in that right direction. And so, um, uh, and I think we're starting to get into the dangerous territory now. Mm. And what's interesting, of course, is that almost none of that data is being actively debated as part of the campaign. No, right? no, that's right. Absolutely <laughs> not. It's like- Which, I, I mean, I find it quite surprising that, um, you know. They don't want to talk about this stuff. That's because they're both on the same page, right? Well, they don't well, want to create any light between them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think Labor wants to be whatever the Liberals are minus five percent, yep. and that's just now I'm better. Than, I just need to be. It's a bit like you know, it's just, you know, the, the the story, the the two hikers out, you know, and they see the bear coming, and it's like, well, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. And so, as long as that's the case, it's saying, well, um, so yeah, so. Uh, so from an economic, so so getting back to you know, elections, so mm. what does it mean if either party gets in? Look, I don't think it makes much difference at all in no. terms of uh, in terms of an investment perspective. Yes, there's a you know, slight differences between them. Hopefully, we'll um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get enough independents or, or other people involved that, that want to change the corruption side that um, they can they can reverse that. But um, yeah, either way, from an investment perspective, I'm treating this as, as pretty much a a um, uh, you know, a wash between the two. Mm. Yeah, well, I've done some analysis around housing and a few other areas, and there's almost nothing between them. Um, and what's interesting is that neither of them want to talk about any of the things where they might be different. <laughs> I mean, other than those little selected areas, a bit on health care on the Labour side, a little bit on defence and on, you know, our borders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's all just, um, you know... High level it's stuff. Fla- it's flavors. It's yeah. like yes, yeah, yeah. it's not saying oh, we're going to we're going to feed you, you know, vegetables and, and health foods and, and we're going to give you ice cream. It's like both parties are saying oh we're going to give you ice cream, but we're going to be vanilla flavor. Oh no no we're going to be strawberry flavor. It's like 
Yeah, well, you're still yeah. getting ice cream. You're not getting, you're not getting the health foods. So I, I guess the interesting question then is, you know, with the election then being not a non-event because it doesn't make make much difference, right? Mm. Given the international situation with Ukraine, with those interest rates going on around the world, what's your perspective from an investment perspective at the moment? You know, I mean, cautious, mm. not cautious. You know, waiting to see what happens. I mean, I, yeah. there are there are a number of people who are saying the amount of uncertainty is massive. Therefore, the best thing to do is wait on the sideline and see how it plays out. There are others saying, no, you're missing an opportunity because there are still value opportunities milling around in the middle of all this. And, and yeah. I, I don't know which the right answer is. Look, nothing's ever 100% certain. You know, there could be a... Um, and so, you know, to position your portfolio into 100% equities or 100% cash or, or whatever it is, um, is... Is for me making more of a, you know, you, you you're basically not acknowledging that things can come from left field and um, you know, whatever it is, technological breakthroughs or or, or huge influxes of, of cash from from governments or, or you know all these different things can go on that can that can, that can change things. Um, what do you expect? My baseline is that um, you know, yes, we try and treat things as as to where they're headed and the trajectory and, and inertia is this great force that's going to drive things in a particular direction. And to me, the, inor- the inertia at the moment is is um, very much driving in the wrong direction. Um, you've either got, you've got to take one of two views on, on inflation. One is that um, inflation is, uh, you know, we've spent too much money from governments and inflation's now, they've lit the fuse and the whole thing's going to explode and, and we're headed for stagflation and, and you know, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle, there's no putting it back in. Um, Inflation expectations are now going to be um, built into economies for for a number of years going forward. So that's that's sort of one one end of the spectrum. But the other end of the spectrum says, well, yes, inflation's high, but um, most of it's sort of either driven from supply chain or um, a lot of the, the energy side from from uh, and the, the whole situation in Russia, um, and that uh, it's 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 all about the shortages and the lockdowns and 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 people, you know, a mixture of governments, but then. Um, so supply chain's not being able to catch up. So it's more about the supply than it is the demand. And so if that's the case and we're going to smash demand back down to the level of supply, then we've had problems getting demand up over the last you know, decade and, and now we're about to smash it down to levels um, to meet this weak supply. There's quite possibly deflation on the other end of it. And, and as we see, um, you know, the Chinese property markets you know, continues to slow. Um, China's now going into all these lockdowns. Um, uh, you know, you can easily paint a picture where we get deflation at the other side. And so all the, yes, we've had this big run up in inflation, but coming out the other side, um, you get this rapid sort of push down the, down the back end of that um, uh, curve and, and you end up with, with seeing prices fall. And I, I think I'm more, I'm, I'm sorry, not what I think, I'm, I'm certainly more on the second case, more that, yeah, it, it's not embedded and, and, and a lot of this is supply chain driven and Russia's made it worse, and, and there could be another event behind it that makes it worse again. Quite possibly it's going to be the, uh, the, the lockdowns we're seeing in China is going to make it worse again and, and, and even more supply chain disruption. But having said it, that's still just a supply – it's one more supply side disruption. Smashing demand down to a lower level is not going to fix those supply issues. Um, and so, uh, yes, that's, that's where I'm, I'm sort of positioning my, my investments around that. But I haven't got 100% certainty. I know there's lots of other things that could crop up. And so it's about saying, well, let's let's run that path where we're sort of tilted in that direction, but we're not sort of taking 100% bet on it. And then as, as events unfold, we can sort of start adding more to that view or, or less to that view as, um, you know, as, as we see events unfold. And um, I think the interest rate side, that's the one, you know, I'm certainly looking at at the moment. You know, I guess I'd, I'd characterise our position as saying, um, you know, last year we, we spoke a lot about here comes this inflation. We think it's an inflation. We think it's a, a commodity. Uh, sorry, an inventory super cycle was what. It, you know, and there's a bunch of other reasons why we're going to see this inflationary boom. Um, and so we sort of shortened up all, all our um, uh, all our yields in our bond portfolio with the view that that'll protect us as as the um, as in, as as we saw interest rates rise and this inflation got going. So that was that was great for the initial part. Then we went. You know what? We've hit sort of two percent. That's that's probably enough. Um, now it's time to go go more normal. 
and and we've and yields have flown a lot further out. So that, so we obviously went way too early on on that. But um, you know these things are sort of a pendulum in my view. And so the pendulum was too far on the short side, and it now swung too far on the long side. There's a time to start picking up um, some of these bonds. And I think we're getting close to that point where you'll actually make some money as that as the pendulum swings back towards that that sort of point of um, that sort of central point where where I think we'll we'll end up. So um, yeah, not quite sure we're we're right ready to do it right at this minute, but we're certainly starting to 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 pick away at that and and to start to to, to head towards that trade. Mm, and it's interesting because the bonds, of course, continue to move higher. In you mm. know, obviously, price and yield move in opposite directions, uh, and. Yep. Um, it's pretty much universal. I mean, Germany is now back into positive territory, right? For yep. Having been negative yeah, yeah, for quite yeah. some time. Um, yep. The the US ten year is you know knocking on three. Um, even in Australia, they've gone up significantly higher oh, than a lot of people expected, more. right? And, and, and yeah, no, the Australian bond yields are higher than basically anywhere else in the world. Developed mm. world, we've got so yeah some of the highest bond yields anywhere, mm. and so. Um, so we're pricing in, as we saw from those charts before, Australia's pricing in basically the best economic recovery ever. Um, and a lot of that's based on commodities. So that's where is it? it's all around, okay, uh, Australia basically has very similar commodities to what Russia has. And so therefore, if Russia's been sanctioned, then Australia's going to be the one that benefits out. So whereas our take is, well, they're commodities. They're going to get moved around the world. Um, China's going to, China and India are both trading with Russia. Openly, and they're just going to consume a lot more Russian wheat and a lot more Russian oil. And um, gas is a little bit of a different issue because it's hard to get there. But um, you know, there's, there's, um, we think things will move around, and and it's it's more about everything will just travel a little bit further. Mm. And just on the bonds, this is the current ten-year uh, Aussie bond. So we're at uh, three point oh eight. So we're over three. And if we mm. then compare that with the US ten-year, that's at um, whoops. 2.789 right so you're right we are higher than <laughs> higher than the US uh, mm. and even the um, uh, well the, you know the German well, the, the German just about everywhere yeah Germany is just over the over the zero right which it didn't used to be but mm. it is astonishing to look at the, Auss that, the Aussie what, bond situation New Zealand I think which as you said New Zealand's already done about a bunch of rate rises I think they're slightly in front of us maybe yeah I think last time I checked um, but, yeah but but yeah. yeah, that's it's it's they're basically the only country that's 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 there. Every other one is um it's pretty much below us. And, and the point about that is that it's not just the um ten year, right? So I mean the, the two year is often seen as a bit of a proxy for interest rates, right? So our, yeah. our two year is sitting now at two point three six seven, right? Well, but, yes. So the other thing though, is what's interesting here is from an international perspective, um one of the things people look at is what's called the steepness of the bond yield curve. Mm. And so they, so basically the 10-year minus the two-year is, is a very common one that people look at. Mm. And what's been happening is the Australian 10 years, the Australian bond yield curve has been steepening, which basically means, usually means good, good things are coming. Mm. And the US bond yield actually inverted recently, which means look out, there's a recession coming. <laughs> and so um, what we're seeing is, yeah, compared to the US, is a, is a complete divergence in terms of the the um, in terms of bond the steepness of the bond yield curve. So yeah, one side we've got Australian bond yield almost not quite as steep as it's ever been, but certainly right up there in terms of the steepness, where, as opposed to the US, which is um, yeah in effectively pretty close to recession territory. Yeah, and uh, those inversions come and go. So the five thirty and the the two ten in the US have happened mm. quite recently, and of course. Then it sort of reversed again. So, you know, is it a signal, isn't it? And um, you can read different people. Some say this is a very strong signal. Others say, well, there's a lot of other reasons this time why it might not be all the quantitative easing, et cetera, et cetera. But I do, mm. I do think this, this difference between the Australian bonds and the US bonds in particular are really worth understanding, right? Because it does signal something quite important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for me, that, you know, the, the key things it's signaling is. Um, is is a commodities boom? Mm. Is an expectation of commodities boom? Yep. And and I, I do want to be clear that yeah, you know, in my view, what we've seen to date is a prices boom in commodities. We haven't seen a volumes boom, and that's a you know to me a commodity super cycle is we see you know fifty percent more pr production 
or, or, or you know, 100% more production in some of these commodities. And that's what we saw in, in as the rise of China, that's what we saw. Um, what we've seen, you know, over the last year or two has been a prices super cycle, not a volume super cycle. Volumes have basically been flat or even down for, you know, some commodity um, uh, shortages due to, you know, supply chains and, and, you know, all the various factors going on. And so, um, you know, that that's, from that perspective, you know, do I, do I look at these and think, well, um, you know, the oil price is $100 because nobody's willing to produce oil at $100? I'm like, absolutely not. You know, people are willing to do a hand over fist. The iron ore price, look at $50. Um, there is bucket loads of iron ore at $50, very profitable. And, and it's sort of closer to, you know, closer to $150. Yeah, there you go. So, there's, there's the iron ore fines at the moment sitting at 154 um, yeah. But I just want to underscore what you said just now because it's really important for you to understand, right? We've made more money, but we've made more money not on bigger volumes but on bigger price. Absolutely. Problem is yeah. that price may not be sustainable, mm. right? And it's interesting yes. that Treasury, when they do their forward budgeting, always take the forward price way down because they have to say, well, it's most likely it'll come off again, right? Now, it hasn't so far. But if demand from China goes away because China economy, you know, continues to sort of freeze up, um, it could well then be the trigger of a fall in those prices. So it's not volume based, it's price based. That's really important to understand. Yeah, that's right. And while I'm talking, I'm just going to see if I can bring up a, um, a long term chart for I've got some of these. Um, I, I, I love to look at all these commodities on an inflation adjusted basis. So what I do is go back and say, um, uh, actually, let's go back to the website. It might be easier. Um, is go back and say, let's take you know 100 years of these commodities, and let's look at how they um, how they go um, under the uh, yeah. If we if we if we adjust for inflation, because most commodities actually fall over time mm. once you adjust for inflation. Mm. Um, and so, uh, sorry, let me just. Uh, I may or may not be able to do that live. Keep, keep going, Martin, with that, your, that's, your questions. That's, fine. Well, I, that's good. So um, I'm not showing your screen because I think you disabled it. So, um, yeah. yeah, so what, there was an interesting question that came in. I just want to pick this one up because it's quite an interesting one. This is from um, uh, G. Bun. Um, what percentage deposit is needed to negotiate a better deal for a home loan? That's a very interesting question. The answer is it depends like a piece of string. But generally, 80%... And above, you start paying more. At 90%, you definitely pay a lot more, and you have to think about lenders, mortgage insurance as well. So, But it does depend on overall income and, and other things too. So there is no silver bullet in terms of trying to answer that particular question. Um, what I'd suggest you do is to look at something like CanStar that actually has all these different um, types of loans with different um, LVRs and things available. But generally, um, the bigger the deposit, the better able you are to negotiate. And certainly if you've got a 20% um, equity in a property, you have a huge amount of additional leverage when it comes to negotiating with the bank. The other point to make is that um, uh, don't just necessarily shop around. If you're with a, a lender now, go back and talk to the lender again because they'll often renegotiate as well because it's cheaper for them to keep you rather than actually them having to re recruit somebody else instead. So hopefully that might help that one. And there was another question um, from earlier on, which I'll just pick up as well, just while we're dealing with this. And that is um, this one here. Let me just try and move my pointer down so I can get it. That's one there. So this is um, from Cross Stitch Ange. Um, I mentioned the RBA was quoting interest only. Yeah. So on the, some of their charts, on some of their ratio charts, they talk about um, the interest payments to income. But the interest payments is only the element that's servicing the loan. It's not actually the total monthly repayments on the mortgage, right? And so whilst they can claim that the interest payments have gone down because interest rates have gone down, the actual total repayment that you're making is a lot higher because the average mortgage is a lot bigger than it used to be. And so in a way, they sort of position their charts quite comfortably just to support their particular view of the world and doesn't necessarily give you the complete picture, right? And in fact, the, the truth is that most people, because they've got bigger mortgages and are paying down a lot more, their repayments are, you know, 30 to 40 percent of their income. So um, that's what I was getting at. So the RBA is not incorrect in what they're saying, but it's just a particular way of looking at it. So that's answering that question. All right. Did you find that? Mm. Did you find that? Yep. Yeah, I've got that chart. Yeah. OK, um, let me just bring you, bring you back up then. Hang on a moment. Let's see whether I can do that. Let's just 
go here, go here. Yeah, you just need to go full screen, or is that the best you can do? I don't know. Uh, I think it might be the best I can do a short okay, notice. Okay. <laughs> I've That's got another one to show. So yeah. the um, so this is the iron ore price, the real iron ore price. So basically, adjusted for inflation over over a long period of time. So you can see it's a hundred and something odd years. Um, it's basically always under fifty dollars. We had this mining boom in the late sixties, where it, um, early seventies, where it sort of shot up to to eighty dollars a ton, and then came back down again. And then we've had the big rise. Then that was actually uh, a lot. Of that was the rise of Japan, and then we've seen the rise of China. This next big boom. Um, the first first one was the rise of China, and then the latest one, which is this, um, yeah, the rocketing up. So, um, and you can just from looking at the um, yeah the, the the profits of the the companies, um, you can see that they're they're very clearly very happy to make money at um, at fifty dollars, um, you know, fifty dollars per ton long term. And then there's a similar one on, on copper where, um, yeah, similar. This is so, so I'm doing this dollars per ton, um, you know, and just sort of showing that again, that's that where we are at that sort of $10,000 mark is historically has been sort of the, you know, that's the highest. It doesn't, doesn't often come down. Um, it, it's often, you know, well below that over, over time. And that the, the real prices are sort of the real long term prices, you know, five or $6,000, roughly half what we are at the moment. Um, there's, there's enough copper out there and and um, uh, demand and, and all that sort of stuff to to just to, to bring on at that levels and and the argument that um, you know electric vehicles are going to use a lot more copper than um, uh, you know that and that's why you should be buying um, look there's some truth to that um, but the thing is electric vehicles just aren't a big part of the the, the copper use they're like ten percent and so even if you doubled or tripled that you know the amount of copper you need for for, for vehicles. Um, uh, over the next say twenty years, you're talking about one percent per annum more copper that's, that's needed. It's just not a big number. Um, so yeah, and, and and again with even with the solar and all that type of stuff like that, like you add in, you add up all the actual amounts you need. It's actually just not that much. So um, you know, a, a, a reasonable growth of a couple of percent per annum would easily solve um, you know the, the copper needs for for a, for a market that's sort of. Um, you yeah, moving to electric vehicles, electrifying, using solar, all that type of stuff like that. So it's one of those grain of truth behind it, but, but it's been pulled way too far. F funny that. Yeah. Um, I want to put this one up. This is from George. Um, has anyone bought a solar power bank? Is it worth it? Now, the reason I've brought this up, because I know that, Damon, you've been doing quite a lot of modelling in terms of solar power and what have you, right? I looked at mm -hmm. this a little while ago, and I realised that the economics of, of batteries attached to solar power didn't make any sense. Um, the solar power itself made a lot of sense, but not the power bank. And even mm. today, I'm still not, I'm a bit sceptical as to whether it makes any sense at all. Have you looked at the battery element within solar power? Yeah, absolutely. Let me start, I'll start with the pre-war calculations. So this is the, and I, I've got a few, um, uh, see if I can show this chart up on there, Martin. I'm not sure if I've got it. Um, I've got this yellow line you can see, which is utility uh, solar. I, I, I'm on your um, your spreadsheet at the moment still, so you need oh, to. Oh right, am I? Must have to stop that sharing and start again. Maybe, maybe I'll uh, let me share this one. Uh, go back on the slide. How's that? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is the this is the price of a utility solar. Um, is the yellow line versus wind and coal and gas? And so you can see this is all pre um, the Ukraine war. So you can see this sort of all coming down. And then then I've got what I call utility solar plus battery with partial shifting. So basically getting a couple of hours to get yourselves through that um, that the night. And then the solar plus battery with the full shifting. So getting you. Um, you know, all the way through the night as well. Uh, so, so that's on the that's on the pre-war. Then you look at and and actually keep in mind this isn't retail. So this is this is um, the utility side. I do do some retail calculations as well, which I've, I, have, I haven't got can't bring up on screen, but I'll, I know what the numbers roughly are. So then I, then you say, well, what happens though if we start using different prices? We actually look at um, because we know that there's uh, there's a levelized cost, which is a before fuel. And then how much does the fuel cost? So that's sort of old natural gas prices. You're paying sort of two cents for the um, uh, for the for the plant, 
and then another two or three cents for the fuel, and you ended up the overall cost you four or five cents a US um, kilowatt. Now, at current natural gas prices in Europe, um, the natural gas is costing you 20 cents. So it means that your solar plus battery or your solar plus, yeah, your utility solar plus battery is now well in the money compared to, and it's all about that cost. And then similarly with coal, um, coal is less sensitive to the price of the of the actual coal. There's, there's sort of more in the upfront um, uh, cost of the plant and, and less in the fuel costs. But um, at current coal prices of sort of two or three hundred bucks a, a ton, um, you, you're again well in the money in terms of in terms of what you're looking at. Um, when you go to solar from a um, from a household perspective, the issue is um, if you're um, yeah the issue of the batteries is. Batteries are still marginal um, unless you're uh, unless you're really using a lot of power within it. So they're still, I'd say, that they're basically at the sort of break-even-ish point. Um, if as if you make the assumption the costs are going to keep coming down, like they have done over the last few years, um, then they start to move into you know, solar plus batteries start to make more of an issue. And if we see uh, prices go up, so if we see that um, you know the coal prices say that where they are, natural gases. Prices stay where they are, and we see that um, energy prices have to go up another twenty percent or thirty percent to, to cater for that. Then batteries all of a sudden becomes um, yeah a lot more a lot more effective in terms of that. And that, but there is a, there's also this decent argument that over the next year or two we probably will see a stalling. So you know, we saw those prices come down quite rapidly over the last ten years. Um, given the, the the massive demand we've got in Europe now because they want to move off Russian gas. And a lot of lot of um, you know, government sponsored um, you know, subsidies and everything they can do to get their um, their populations off this Russian gas uh, is that uh, quite possibly there's going to be this scarcity issue that that keeps solar prices high for a couple of years. But I do think the underlying trend of that you know we're we're, we're going from solar units producing a thousand a month to producing two thousand a month to producing ten thousand a month, and that just that price drops alone just from doing more volumes. That trend's still there. It's just hidden because there's this massive demand which sort of, and our supply is not, not equaling out. But um, solar is a commodity product. Mm. It's not a, um, it's, it can be produced by, you know, a number of companies um, and, and there's going to be more and more people doing it. Uh, we had somebody on our podcast the other day, um, he's sort of an expert talking about saying, you know, once you've actually got the, the, the solar wafers, um, there was a, a factory set up in in Adelaide, and it took less than a year to have the whole thing up and running and, and at full tilt. And during the pandemic, and so um, yeah, the, even building the factories is not that um, not that big of a task for for that side of it. Um, and the solar wafers, um, you, you know, if you're building the latest and greatest ones, yeah, the the, the, the process is quite complicated and, and can be um, can be more expensive and need specialized machinery. But if we're producing um, you know, the 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 uh, the ones from you know the last few years um, compared to uh, the 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 work that needs to go into some of the higher end ones. It's actually quite a basic pro- process um, to produce those as well, and so very much a commodity product. Um, as soon as they can scale up to the level, um, they will. And so um, so yeah. So from my perspective, it's it's a there, there'll there'll be this underlying cost thing, cost dropping trend that we're not going to see for a few years because of scarcity. And then we'll come out the other end of that, and we'll just see some quite quite sharp drops again, I think, in those costs, and um, and that then opens it up to, um, I think, a lot less volatility in 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 um, fuel prices. It'll actually be a great thing overall because you'll you'll hit that level where um, uh, you know the coal price will no or the gas price going up and down will no longer influence the um, the, the price of energy because it'll be about that solar plus battery cost that's um, that sort of determines the the upper upper end of the prices. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I think uh, we've probably answered the question quite well, but I'll make one other point because we've done quite a lot of work here to figure out the best configuration for solar panels. And um, we've got trees, and the trees mm. actually cast quite a shadow across the property later in the afternoon. And what yeah. you then discover, if, you, if you're not careful, is that the solar power output is actually regulated back to the power from the least powerful point on the roof. Right. right. So as, mm. as, as one or two panels essentially go into the shade, the whole power drops 
Uh, and you mm -hmm. have to have a much more complicated management process and system to be able to actually still extract the power from the rest of the solar panels. Now, mm. interestingly, four or five of the various people that we spoke with, none of them actually recognised that, only one did, right? But as soon as I asked the others about it, they all said, well, yeah, we, but it's true, but, you know. <laughs> so th my point is, there's a lot of traps here. Mm. There are traps also relating to the, to, to the replacement of the batteries and the cost of the replacement and the guarantees and how long the guarantees last relative to the, the replacement cycle. So there's a lot more to this than I think a lot of the, um, uh, the, the people who are flogging this stuff actually recognise. So, again, I look, yeah. I'm a little bit cautious. Yeah, absolutely. I guess, though, so, I would say anyone who's building something new, I would seriously consider do you need gas at all? Because I, I, I think if you do the calculations on the, um, you know, if I've got solar and I've got batteries and running, um, then do I have, uh, and, and I can avoid that 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 quarterly gas, you know, disconnection charge, then all of a sudden there's a, um, yeah, that, that makes the economics uh, look a lot better, I guess, if you can avoid that, some of those costs. Absolutely. But again, do do the homework is what I, what I think I'm underscoring, right? How often do yeah, I say yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and yeah, and the other thing with a lot of this as well is, um, like, when you look at these, you're like, oh, okay, so all these costs keep coming down, therefore um, all these solar companies are going to be great investments. And you're like, oh, no, they haven't been great investments. No. There's too many, too much competition. They're all it's a race at the bottom. Yep. Chinese are willing to produce at much lower prices. Yep. You're like, oh, well, what about the solar farms? They must be this great investment. You're like, well, the problem with the solar farm is you set one up today and it is it'll be profitable based on, you know, you well usually the profit based on the economics you put in, but somebody builds another solar farm next door to you next year, their costs are going to be lower than yours because they've just built them with the latest panels, which are slightly more you know efficient than yours, and you know that might have been cheaper or whatever it is. And so, the lowest cost provider is always the guy who just built one yesterday, rather than the, the person who built one ten years ago. Yep. And so, um, yeah, so there's sort of that um, you've got that issue of of saying that um, it's. Uh, I think the technology is going to be fantastic for society as a whole. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the companies involved in it are going to be great investments, yep. which is, um, yeah, always a, a trick as well. Exactly right. And just to reconfirm, yeah, microinverters was exactly the point. So, you, But that's a more expensive route than uh, some of the ones that um, are, mm. are on offer, hence the, uh, the need to do that. And, uh, you know, this is interesting. Some people are saying, yeah, well, you know, I've actually managed to make some savings. Because I think you can. But all mm. I'm saying is it's not as a lay down as there. There's a bit of work that yeah. needs to be done. Well, and the other, hey, while we're talking, I should give a plug out to um, uh, David Morgan from Iron Matrix. And so that, that's a, he he's runs a, um, a company that they make the whole house out of solar panels. Mm. And so basically their, their insight was really was that actually the price of a wall is now more expensive than the price of a solar panel. <laughs> so if you... Um, if you put the right uh, steel framing and everything like that, you can make your entire house out of solar panels, and um, you can have your whole house generating uh, mm. generating electricity. So yes, fascinating. Well, we've got mm. five minutes left. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of things we haven't been able to cover on the uh, on the questions tonight, but um, let me just uh, sort of try and try and shape the conversation back to a, a couple of um, issues relating potentially to how Ukraine may play out. Because, of course, one of the unknowns in all of this is to whether, in fact, this conflict is going to continue and escalate or whether it's not going to continue and escalate. In other words, whether it's going to be contained or whether, whether it's not. Do you mm. factor that into your, your strategy at the moment in terms of your investment uh, portfolio or is it just too far over the hill to be able to actually, um, you know, make a position or make a judgment on it? Um, look, it's certainly something. It, it's it's certainly something we're keeping an eye on and, and keeping abreast of what's happening. Um, the net effect from an economic point of view is, um, you know, the the eleventh largest economy in the world has has attacked the fifty seventh largest co co uh, country in the world. It's actually not that big of an effect overall. Like when you take when they take the globe as a whole, um, but it does make a big difference um, when you start looking at the geopolitical eruptions that's happening in terms of sanctions on Russia, um, you know, China siding with, uh, you know, how much are they siding with Russia? What does that mean for China in terms of their designs upon Taiwan? What does that mean for China in terms of um, 
companies who who are deciding. We spoke about a lot about offshoring in prior ones about saying um, a lot of companies took all their product production, put it all in China, and then the pandemic hit, and then there was this sort of and sorry, first we had Trump with his tariffs hit, then we had the the pandemic hit, and a lot more thinking. Well, maybe I'm actually better off with um, with factories in 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 the US or factories in Australia and running them off robots, and actually I can get the cost down. To, to pretty similar levels to what you'd, you'd find in China, um, and then then you have, add in the, the the whole Russia situation and supply chain issues, and that makes that decision that much more likely. Now we add in um, uh, more shutdowns in in China, and and we haven't really seen the effects of that, but we're certainly um, you know uh, th- they're coming over the next month or two. We're certainly gonna, we're certainly going to see the effect of, of of the lockdowns that happened in Shanghai and and quite potential. Um, uh, the lockdowns that are happening in in Beijing as well. And that's just one more thing that's going to move you know, more offshoring. So so yeah, we've got a few a few companies in our portfolio. We think uh, are picking up from that, and and we think that's a trend that you know over the next couple of years is going to play out. Whether you make money on it, you know, right this minute or um, or, or, or not, but I, th- I think they're certainly companies you should have your eye on and be looking for those companies that are going to benefit from that um, sort of re onshoring. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so so much to watch. <laughs> I think the next oh, two or three absolutely. months will be um, particularly interesting. Um, RBA will probably lift the rate. I don't think they'll lift them in May. I probably they'll do it in June after the election. I think they're too um, <laughs> uh, too politically sensitive to do it now. I think inflation I think- will come out quite a lot stronger than people expect, and that mm. will be an extra incentive for the Reserve Bank to move. Um, and my own sense is the election will probably end up as some... Um, a significant proportion of um, unaligned votes, in other words, small parties, because I think neither of the main parties is actually really capturing the imagination or showing a vision for the future. And there are a number of people that I'm sort of listening to and, and a lot of people saying, well, there's no difference, why, why, why bother, right? So, uh, And then, of course, the international stuff, the Fed will put rates up. I wouldn't be surprised to see 50 or 100 basis points in the next couple of months uh, from the US. Um, New Zealand is looking to put rates up again next time around, according to the um, the latest analysis there. So rates are going up. Mm-hmm. Interest rates mean going up means prices are going to come down. So home prices is probably a bit weaker. Um, and um, we're seeing that already in the in, in the markets here with um, more prices being cut and uh, significant supply. So interesting times, Damien. Yeah, absolutely. We keep on saying, I think we've said the last few times that, you know, this is this is as uncertain as, as, as it's been for a long time, and hopefully by next month things will have cleared up a little bit more. And it seems every time we say that, there's another another three issues crop up just to, to make it even more complicated. So I'm not going to avoid saying that this time. It'll be more complicated next time we speak. But, yeah. um, it, it's it's like the old jugglers be- act, right? So we you know we're throwing all these balls, and then somebody throws another one in. You've got to try and catch that one as well, right? Um, <clears throat> which means the uncertainty level <clears throat> continues to rise. But yeah, then, that, that's why we have to run these shows. And um, I reckon by yeah. the time you come back in the next month, uh, <laughs> there'll be a whole new ball game. <laughs> yeah, and I guess for my tip, um, you know, I don't have any major issues with what you're, you know, with what you're talking about there. The thing I'd, I think I'd keep watching is is what's happening in China. Mm. I think that's actually going to be the um, that's what's really going to drive markets, certainly in Australia and 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 probably elsewhere as well. Because if you get a if, if these rolling shutdowns, which are sort of, um, you know, making a, a reasonable effort on a reasonable dent into China's production, if that keeps going for for months, which uh, at the moment it's, it's hard to see how it won't, um, yeah, that's really going to start putting a dent into the rest of demand for, for the world. Uh, it's going to make more supply chain problems. It's going to cause more short-term um, issues in terms of inflation and, and things like that. Um, that's really where... Um, yeah, if I was going to pick a spot, where's the instability going to come from that could that could see the markets put turned down? That's that's my sort of number one um, pick for for where it is. I, I think what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine is pretty much baked in, unless unless it goes, um, you know, let's say uh, you start seeing the use of nuclear weapons or something like that. Um, uh, I do think that. Uh, you know whether it gets bogged down or, or or you see some more gains by the Ukraine or more gains by Russia. You know, at the margins, not going to make a lot of difference for markets. I think they're sort of there's a, that's you know without without it going nuclear, I think largely that's all priced in, um, and and the shock is no longer there. 
But I do think there's um, you can see some shocks coming out of um, out of China in terms of growth. That's where. Um, yeah, the most danger, I guess. Mm. Well, that's certainly where I'm focusing at the moment. Uh, I've made a couple of shows on China recently and I'm going to do more because I don't think people comprehend, one, how linked our economy is to China and, mm. and how dramatically that could change if, in fact, the China thing fell off a log. But also that point I made earlier on about the net, net investment now coming out of China rather than going into China because of the movements in the relative exchange rates and interest rates. That's mm. quite profound. So, and of course, Absolutely. we've got the, the property and, situation in China as well. well. So there are some very yeah. important leading indicators. And so, and, and on the property side, I mean, uh, you know, my takes that um, the amount of commodities that go into that property sector is like it's, a, it's the biggest consumer in the world of commodities. And so, um, and we, we've seen things fall from, you know, come back from the, the massive highs we had over the last couple of years, but we're still not even back to sort of, you know, 2012 levels, the property sector was running hot in China in, and we're still not down to those levels. Like we'd have to fall another 20, 30% just to get to the levels where it was already running really hot. Yep. So um, if they're genuinely serious about rebalancing that that side of it, and I do think they are, um, then that's got a long way to go still. And that's a you know, huge, um, yeah. Uh, the flip side is if they change tomorrow, if they turn around tomorrow and go, you know what? Things are pretty tough. We're going to have to put off all these property reforms for another five or ten years. Um, it's back on. No more three red lines. Then iron ore is back to two hundred bucks. Mm. To, you know, two hundred fifty bucks. God knows where it's going. Yep. Um, and, and and it's all on for Australia. So um, you know, I think that's your um, yeah. That's that's your part about saying you're one hundred percent equities or one hundred percent not in equities or whatever it is. That's your um, you know. I do think the I do think it's headed down, but you could see um, yeah. The Chinese government could try and turn around and and just throw the kitchen sink at it. Well, we'll be ready to watch and see whether the kitchen sink lands and how it impacts. And we'll we'll do it yeah. again next month. Thank you very much, Damien. Really appreciated your time tonight. Very interesting conversations. The uh, the yeah, chat was so. appreciative too. And uh, look forward to the next one. And just to say, uh, if you want to find more about um, the services that Damien provides through Walk the World Fund, just go to walktheworld.com.au. Um, it's all in there. Damien runs a portfolio of funds that actually um, <laughs> are doing not bad in the current environment, actually still hanging in, right? A few ups and downs, of yes. course. Yes. But uh, you're still there and still looking at uh, the markets and still making calls, which is great. And uh, appreciate all, all the insights that you share and um, all the um, uh, time you give to, to the channel here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Great. I'll take you offline and I'll just close the show. See you later. Right, so there you go, folks. I hope you found that useful. Very interesting conversation. Uh, always worthwhile listening to Damon. He's uh, across so much information and uh, knits it together so well. Just to say that next week, um, I'm going to be joined in the studio, no less, by Steve King. And we're going to talk about the uh, economic imperatives and the political imperatives ahead of the election. So that'll be an interesting conversation. So uh, join, us, uh, join us there and uh, ask a question live of Steve. Uh, of course, um, Steve will be able to talk about his housing policy, but also more generally about what, what he sees economically as well. So it'll be uh, worthwhile. Just before I uh, close out, just to highlight the fact that the dogs are still asleep. <laughs> They've hardly moved all evening, but um, obviously we're listening intently to what we were saying. So <laughs> that's probably why they're uh, sound asleep. And I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. Um, check out our shows during the week and check back next week, next Tuesday for our next live show. Have a good evening. Keep safe, and I look forward to the next one. This is Martin North from Digital Finance and the Leagues, signing off. Cheerio.